Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do today is, uh, well, let me just uh, backtrack a second. What I spend most of my time on these days is talking about what's going on in Venezuela right now. In fact, oftentimes I have to sort of update within 30 seconds before talking because things change so, ap so, 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 so rapidly in Venezuela that uh, uh, it's a little bit hard to keep up. But I'm going to take, the, take the, this opportunity today to sort of take a step back and look at Chavismo, particularly during the Chavez period, and sort of take an inventory. What can we say, what can we think about uh, right now that went right, what went wrong, and what could be different? Um, and sort of uh, give an overview that hopefully will generate discussion. I understand that this is a forum that's supposed to be about public issues. And so uh, instead of something more intensely scholarly, this is sort of an overview and meant to generate some discussion. Okay, so first, what, what did Chavismo do right? Now, uh, this is actually the subject of quite a bit of uh, debate and controversy, but if you look at some of the figures, it's quite clear that during the Chavez period, uh, there was actually some success in addressing poverty. Now, th these are statistics that come from, this is tabulated by Provea, which is an independent human rights group and actually quite critical of the government and, and almost always in danger of being closed by the government. They, in 2012, put forward or uh, compiled statistics on sort of the first, the first 15 years of Chavez. And so this is sort of a, uh, one, of the, one of their summary tables. No, this is, uh, looks at poverty. If you look at the red line, that is a basic way of uh, understanding poverty. It's sort of the income level. It's adjusted for inflation and adjusted for uh, devaluation of the currency as well. And however you cut it, no, basically, poverty went down from around 50% when Chavez took power, or the year before he took power, down to closer to 30%. That was a pretty significant uh, um, achievement. If you, look at, if you look at it in terms of inequality, you know, oftentimes poverty and inequality don't necessarily go the same direction. You can have poverty that goes down and inequality that goes up. But in this case, inequality also dropped. If you look at that blue line, that's a Gini coefficient and basically one is the highest and zero would be zero would be perfect inequality perfect equality and, and one would be uh, uh, perfect inequality so they started at about 0 0.48 and by 2011 it was down to 0 0.39 no that was a, a pretty significant um, uh, achievement if you look beyond this if you look at other figures if you look at access to education access to health uh, access to identification, Consumption, protein consumption, nutrition, I, all of these in this, in, this, in this period, there was success on all of these factors, really any, any way you cut it. Well, there were some ex exceptions. Housing and things actually uh, worsened during this time. Okay, second, increased participation. Now, this uh, is one of the things that Chavismo is most famous for, no? is the fact that it, uh, it actually got people participating. No, back in the 1990s, in the neoliberal 1990s, there was a real sense of malaise. One of the things that Chavez did, in fact, his, his chief sort of slogan in the 1998 election was precisely uh, that uh, democracia participativa. It was going to be de de participatory democracy. No, we see throughout uh, the Chavez period, there's actually declining abstention in terms of elections, participation in elections. Of course, there's several different ways of reading that, but it is a fact that electoral abstention declined. And then, of course, there were all these participatory uh, instruments. Starting in 2004, 2005, there was a big push, first for cooperatives, no, to try, people were going to form cooperatives and there would be state contracts, service contracts that would go to these cooperatives. Uh, after that, communal councils became sort of the focus of, of, of Chavismo's, uh, Chavez's participatory policy. Along with communal councils, there were things like urban land communities, the land, land uh, uh, committees. These were groups that would get together and try to fight for the regularization of, of 
plots of land. You no, know? in urban areas, many of the informal sector in in Caracas, like many places in in Latin America, people will build their housing and they don't have title to the land. You no, know? and so there was this whole process in which people pressured for that and formed these committees and when we're able to regularize the, 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 their lots of land. Same thing with water, places that didn't have water, they, there were these committees that could get together, they come up with a plan for installation of, of water, water service. Uh, so all of those things, I think, were uh, uh, undeniable achievements. Third, uh, what we can call, and, and this, is, this is kind of a gloss, but structural change to uh, address inequality. No, so there were a number of laws that, that were passed uh, during the Chavez era that really looked, um, uh, that really tried to use the power of the state to uh, push forward inequality. And this is, if, 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 you've, if you've read uh, 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 Ken's book, Deepening Democracy, and you know the difference between uh, um, uh, deepening democracy or, or, or making it more democratic in political sense and extending democracy. No, it's actually the extending democracy that's actually more controversial because that ends up uh, impinging on economic interests. And it was really these things. When Chavez was just sort of trying to come up with a new democratic structure during the process of rewriting the Constitution in 1999, his popularity was up in 80% at that time. No, it wasn't until 2001, the package of laws that came in 2001 that democratized or, or, or changed the, the, the land uh, regime, changed fishing rights, and also changed the, the hydrocarbon uh, laws. That's when things really started to get conflictive. No? On top of that, uh, 2006, there was a, an indigenous law, or a law on indigenous lands that was one of the most progressive in the region, and I think did a lot. It was very sketchy in its implementation. But the ideas behind it were good and, and did quite a bit to sort of improve the situation of indigenous people and, and the regularization of their land. Um, 2008, 2008, there was a new policing law, a law that brought in human rights uh, training for police officers and had, had a quite interesting structure to it. I mean, it's gone in a completely different direction, but the original law is, is, is quite good. And then, of course, one of the most famous things that Chavez did were the missions, you know, the, the health missions, the missions to you know, bring Cuban doctors to the people, to bring uh, uh, alphabetization to people. You no, know, there, there's any number, of, uh, a couple of dozen different missions that basically what they try to do is take social policy to the people. In the process, they also sort of skirted the existing uh, bureaucracy, which uh, uh, had some needs I'll talk, or some consequences I'll talk about in a second. Um, but you know, it was an interesting uh, uh, effort at trying to democratize uh, the country. Uh, finally, incorporation through communication. You know, dur during during the Chavez period, there was a huge effort, especially after the conflict of two thousand four to try to uh, expand communication. No, so there was an expansion of public broadcasting. No, Venezolana Televisión is, is the sort of state television. Back when I first went to Venezuela in the early 1990s, it was like, it was a joke. I mean, it was just like really low tech, underfunded, nobody watched it. No, now it goes across the country, no, and, and it has really slick uh, professional broadcasting. Later. There's TV, Telesur, which was uh, something that was supposed to be like Al Jazeera or CNN, no, that, that Venezuela sponsored and at one time uh, was uh, supported by any number of other countries in the region. Cati TV, JVK Mundial, was a radio station. No, after, after 2007, when Can TV, which was the national telecommunications company, was nationalized, there was a huge effort to try and universalize, uh oh, universalize. Um, access to telephone and internet. At that time, there were still many places, many rural areas in Venezuela that didn't have telephone service, and very few people had access to internet. That was really highly democratized at this time. Okay, so that's, that's the good. All these things, I think, on their own are things that have to be recognized and make a lot of sense, given the context that, that Chavez rose up in. Uh, now let's, now let's look at what uh, Chavismo did wrong, in my view. No, first uh, is the economic model. No? Basically, the economic model, of course, was based on, on oil ex exploitation. No, it's an oil country. 
it's an oil uh, um, economy. No, but what really happened during Chavez, especially after after the the, the conflict of 2003-2004, is that there was a, a, an exchange rate that was completely overinflated. No, and so uh, if we look at this, you know, during Chavez, this is maybe you can see this here, but. This, this black line is the official exchange rate. During Chavez died in, and really gave up power in, in November 2012, most of the time during Chavez, this exchange rate was about double, was about 200%. Uh, uh, the, the, parallel, the parallel exchange rate was about 200% of what the regular exchange rate. So this, this caused, what did this cause? This meant that imports, were cheap, no, uh, and it meant that exports were not competitive, no. So this creates sort of a local boom in the economy. It, it Im increases consumption. It's very popular with people because your money goes further. You can buy all these good imported goods. It's very bad for local in industry, of course, because you can't export anything. But things that could kind of address the, the internal market did okay, no. So this was uh, a, a sort of a long-term policy during Chavez, this caused something that is referred to in economics as Dutch disease. No, this is this is, you you end when you have this very high-priced, uh, uh, valuable commodity. It's very difficult for the rest of the economy because it ends to it, it tends to increase the exchange rate and make everything else not viable. No, okay, so Nicolas Maduro takes over here. No, and so. Here, the, the exchange rate is about 100% inflated. If you look over here, about, about 16 months ago, January 2018, the exchange rate, the parallel exchange, the, the official exchange rate was 10 bolivares, which is the local currency, per dollar. The parallel rate was about 100,000. No? And so, in other words, the I'm not sure if I get the math right, but it's the it was ten thousand percent higher than the than the the official. Rate. So you can imagine what this what does this create? It means that anybody that has access to official rate dollars, no, you could say to the government, okay, I want to import a million dollars worth of bicycle or a hundred thousand dollars worth of bicycles. You get a hundred thousand dollars. From the from the government, and you only import a thousand dollars worth of bicycles. You put that ninety nine thousand dollars onto the parallel market, and you have fabulous, fabulous profits. No, so the, this is this is sort of the the source of some of these radical distortions that you see in the Venezuelan economy. No, is 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 this exchange rate? I think that that was you know I think this is the biggest error of the Maduro the Chavez slash Maduro era. No, and I think this is what really undermined. Their economy. Okay. Secondly, is Chavez's polarizing discourse? No. Chavez had a discourse uh, that had various stages. You know, I think, in essence, it's a populist discourse that talks about the people, the people as sort of this 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 moral entity that has been betrayed by uh, a conspiring elite. No, that's where it started. By the by, by the second half, I was the second term. It had become a socialist discourse, and so the conspiring elite were the oligarchy, were the bourgeoisie, and and the people were you know the workers and, and the proletariat, uh, and and you know uh, it was a very much a polarizing discourse. So what happens when you do this is that you end up uh, making political conflicts into existential conflicts. No, so instead of the opposition thinking, okay, we have this crazy guy as a president, but we're going to win the next time around, and he's going to give up power. No, he would say things like, "The oligarchy is never going to come back into power. Chavez is going to be here for fifty years." No, he would say all kinds of things like that that basically expressed that uh, uh, he would never give up power. No, and so one of the basic elements of democracy. Is the alter, uh, alternation of power? No. If you have this idea that okay, I've been voted out this time, but I'll have another chance. Well, it can get people to act more democratically. And so, one of the things that this did is is and you know, and I'm trying to just give the sort of the, the side analysis of Chavismo here because I think you could, I could talk all day long about crit criticism of the opposition as well. 
But what this does is when you when you do this to an opponent, it makes them uh, you know into uh, makes them choose for non democratic uh, techniques or or practices. Okay. Uh, thirdly, the, the revolutionary discourse that Chavez uh, chose to use in in his project really undermines uh, some of the basic values I think of. Uh, of a government, which is institutional solidity, transparency, and accountability. No, there was this idea, and, and we were just talking about this uh, earlier today, that you know Chavez, if you can believe this, this government that's been so corrupt, one of his main slogans in, in 1999 was the idea of uh, anti-corruption. He was very much against corruption. He was very much saying that we are going to fix corruption, we're going to get beyond corruption. Uh, but his idea of it was that, well, we just have to have the right people in the right place. No. Once the conflict got going, and once he took up sort of socialism as his main slogan, uh, you know, all ideas of transparency and accountability were sort of labeled as bourgeois. No, basically, you had to be along, you know, uh, on the side of the government, show yourself to be a really dedicated and loyal revolutionary, and nobody would really ask questions. You know? and this is something that has uh, uh, millions of different iterations. You no, know, everything from large scale corruption to how people deal with communities. You no, know, one person that I know that worked in the government, uh, you know, there, this would lead to battles such as the following. They would go, her institution would go to uh, a neighborhood. They would have a neighborhood meeting, and the the rules said that they had to have meeting minutes that then the community then read. Commented on and voted on, no. And when she suggested that they do that, they said, "Well, no, we'll write the meeting minutes, no, and, and that's it." And he was like, "Well, they actually the people." He said, "Well, we are the people, no. You, you, you're you're caught up in this old bourgeois idea that the state is different than the people. We are the people, no. And so, uh, you know, this is one of the one of the issues that I think really undermine the sustainability of this project is that it just did not value institutional solidity. And you know, if you think back to sort of Leninist, Marxist uh, perspective, institutions are, are the problem. You no, know? Institutions are something that you are going to eventually overcome. And there were actually people that worked in the state that would say things like, well, we know that our job is temporary, and if we do it really well, we're going to disappear. Our, our institutions are going to disappear. So there just was not this value uh, placed on institutional solidity, which is, of course, what undermines sustainability. Uh, Oh, here's, here's just a, a picture of this. Uh, this is actually during the Maduro era, but the exact same thing happened during Chavez. Now, what this is, if you can't see, they are, this, is a, this is like a, a, a march, a pro-government march. This is a truck with a stage on top of it, you know, with government supporters there. And Seniat is the, the, is the national tax. It's like our IRS. You know? And so they are there. In a pro-government march with Chavez on the side of the truck, and it says it has a hash, hashtag, aquí no se habla mal de Chavez. You know, the hashtag, you don't speak bad about Chavez here. And this is something that you will see when you go into the airport, any public institution you go to, they will have this hashtag, you no, know, that you can't say anything negative about Chavez in that space. You no. Know? And so if you can just if you can just imagine in a uh, in a parade here, the IRS having its own pro-government. You know, which I actually Trump might we should do that someday, but yeah. Is there, can you say anything bad about Maduro though? Uh, about Maduro? Maduro. Uh, oh, you know, oh, yeah, actually, you know, that, that would be the interesting next step because I think that would be a really hard one because one of the favorite pastimes right now is that in public spaces, people will say, will yell, Maduro, and everybody will respond, "Coño su madre." <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, so so uh, apparently that's fair game so far. Um, anyway, uh, okay, so you, you can you can get the sense in, in anybody that lived there during the Chavez period, and sometimes you would have to do uh, bureaucratic things, you know, uh, errands and things, uh, you know, get your identification papers, and you go, and the office would be closed. Why? Because they're at a march. You no know, public employees were rallied. To do this all the time. Okay, finally, uh, in terms of communication, no, uh, there was a communication model. They developed a communication model 
that, that really un undermined feedback loops, undermined what communication, what critical communication is supposed to do. No, critical communication is supposed to be able, is, is our way, uh, is human society's way of self-orienting. You know, if, you, if you think in terms of biological evolution, no, the natural selection happens. If you think in terms of human development, if we don't want to talk about evolution, human, human development, it happens through feedback. No, when things go wrong, we hear about it and people can change course uh, or, or choose different leaders. You know? However, in, in, in Venezuela, especially from, the, from Chavez's second term, what happened is that there was a really a hegemonic model of, of communication that developed. No? So uh, state-sponsored media had really far-reaching uh, editorial control. You know, everything from community radio and newspapers to the state television channel was 100% pro-government you know, and, and very much required to be so. If, if people, if journalists weren't, they were pushed out. Uh, in 2013, there was a big change, well not just 2013, uh, in, in 2007, uh, one of the leading television channels was uh, basically, its concession was not renewed. Uh, then in 2013, um, Global Vision, which was the big, is like, the, is like Venezuela's CNN, 24-hour news, very critical of the government, and El Universal, which was the biggest newspaper, were both sold in very sort of non-transparent investor groups that nobody knew of and which paid really incredible prices for for these these media outlets and immediately afterwards they were very much reduced their critical line uh, there was also restricted access to newsprint uh, in Venezuela of course a lot of this happens precisely at the time that there's there's scarcities no you couldn't get toilet paper either but newsprint you know was not available for most newspapers except for a few a handful of pro-government pro newspapers and what we've seen is that most national regional newspapers have have actually gone under, really many of them just in the past couple of years. And finally, harassment, pursuit of critical journalists, journalists that have been jailed, journalists that have had their passports taken away, punished in different ways, uh, you know, uh, uh, have had really uh, sizable lawsuits or fines against them, you no, know, that just unpayable fines. And so uh, that, I think, is, is one of the things that really really is one of the most, uh, if you want to want to understand how we've gotten to the current debacle in, in, in Venezuela, this is one of the most important ones. In fact, and it explains a few things. If you, you know, if, if you follow Venezuela, you follow the black, blackouts, you know, Nicolas Maduro has said that there was a cyber attack, you know, even though the, you know, the electricity system is actually is closed, it is not connected to the internet, it's a cyber attack. He said there's been electromagnetic attack from unspecified means. He's been, they said there's been a sniper attack. And in fact, they, on, on state television, they put on a video of Jason Bourne from the sniper. You no, know, and, and all of these things just seem like absolutely crazy. But if you realize that in many places in Venezuela, outside of Caracas, Maracaibo, Valencia, in the interior, all that gets there is state media. No. Well, you know, saying some really crazy things can actually be sort of the leading explanation if, you, if, you, if you're in the interior. And so uh, they have a really hegemonic control. I mean, what, what, you, what you get, what people see on the outside is so different from what people see on the inside, especially if you, if you have internet connection and you're used to looking at web portals like Efecto Cocuyo or international news, you'll get a very different impression than what most people see in Venezuela because most people see depend on free news that's often uh, provided to them from, by the government. Okay, so of course, uh, uh, I, am, I am fully aware that what I said, um, the good and the bad were two sides of the same coin, you no? Know? And this is, this is sort of what, uh, uh, one of the dilemmas of, of, of governance, you no? Know? Reducing poverty and inequality in, a, in an economy with one really high-priced commodity is very difficult without uh, letting the exchange rate get inflated. And having your, inflate, your exchange rate inflate is a really nice way to increase consumption. You know? uh, and that is indeed one of the reasons that there was so, such an increase in, in consumption in Venezuela. How do you get participation to increase? Well, one 
One way, and this is, the, this is the classic from your theoretical texts on populism, is that populist discourse is what can get people mobilized. You know? And this is, this is, this is why uh, you know, populists left and right have often seen populism as the motor, as the way to get people mobilized. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump can do it. Uh, uh, Hugo Chavez can do it. No. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a polarizing discourse. Its very nature is that it is polarizing, and it has these other other effects. It's not just another political battle for most people, because people, you know, experience it as an existential battle. Um, finally, uh, or no, uh, next, the structural changes that uh, reduce inequality. No, if anybody who's worked in the public sector knows how difficult change can be. No, how do you get institutions to to turn around institutions that oftentimes are, are syndicalized. In other words, they have very they have organized labor. They have ways of working. There's all kinds of vested interests. It can be like trying to turn a ship around, you know, in 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 a small in in a river. Uh, so one of the ways to do this is what what Chavez did. He came up with all kinds of parallel institutions, and oftentimes sort of generated. Uh, Emotion and you know this volunteerism, this real spirit that we can change this, we can do this. So instead of the instead of okay, I have a I have a plan for changing the health ministry that's going to take 15 years. He said no, we're gonna we're gonna have these missions with Cuban doctors that are gonna come and they're gonna go to Barrios, and you can have that going in a couple of weeks. No. Uh, and if you have all kinds of cash to burn, you, you know you have any problem, you can throw cash at it. That works for a while and can work really well. Let me tell you. These, these missions and some of the participatory uh, instruments were really impressive. You know, when, I, when I first went to Venezuela in the 1990s, I ended up stu studying popular religion, not so much because I was that interested in religion, I was interested in civil society, but that was kind of the only game in town. You, know? you would go to some barrios in Caracas, and all you would find are evangelical churches or Catholic priests working with, with, with people in, in those barrios, and they were, they were just like completely forgotten. You know, ten years later in in Venezuela, uh, you would see you know you would see different missions there were you know that were there attending to people. You would see education missions. You would see you know technical water tables. The communal council web signs up for the meeting. It was just a completely different sort of social geography. Um, uh, so you know, but all of these things often were motored by money and not with any clear sort of institutional structure or any forms of accountability. So all kinds of the money that went to uh, uh, cooperatives, that went to communal councils, I mean, there's huge amounts of sort of unanswered questions about the fund. Nobody has any idea where they went uh, uh, because, because they just didn't have much uh, accountability. Uh, Incorporation through communication, of course, and this is what Chavismo said right from the beginning. He said, "Okay, well, we came from we came from a period in which there was neoliberal uh, uh, hegemony of of communication, and I think that's that's not crazy. I remember in, in the 1990s in Venezuela, you basically got the same message from all the different channels. There was very little diversity. No." Ten years later, by 2000, 2009 or so, there was actually a pretty democratic sort of uh, spectrum of education or of, of media, much more than there had been in the 1990s. But their idea from the beginning is that this was going to be a new hegemony, you know? that they were constructing a new hegemony for, for this new society. And, and so uh, you know, basically this hegemonic, this hegemonic battle, you know, for a while, created more more democracy until they kind of got what they want, and then it became a new hegemony, which I think is very unfortunate. Okay, so you'll see the title there is Beyond Dilemmatization, because what I want to say with that is all of these bad issues are logical outgrowths of efforts, you know, these positive efforts. You no, know? they're logical outgrowths, but I don't think they're necessary. You no, know, I think they're, it could have been different. It could have been... Uh, uh, done in a different way. And I'm just going to you know, float out some ideas of how this could have been different. You know? if, if, instead of, uh, uh, if instead of resting on this inflated exchange rate, which increased consumption also made the middle class very happy because they could travel to Miami and, and do their shopping there, 
they had just focused on growth through oil revenue. This is an oil economy. This is a, a, an oil country. I don't, think it's, I don't think it should be controversial that they should be able to use their oil to be a motor of economic growth, but just focus on that without, without letting the exchange rate um, uh, inflate. I think that would have allowed a much more sustainable economic growth. Not the big flash growth, but a much more sustainable economic growth. Uh, Instead of increasing participation through polarizing discourse, I think there could have been a discourse that would not have been, would not have mobilized as much, but could have been quite compelling. You no, know? and there were times when Chavez kind of talked this way, especially at the beginning, uh, sort of a pro-majorities, anti-poverty discourse. You no, know? um, I think I think I might have messed up my slide there. I wanted to say pro-majorities, anti-poverty, anti-corruption discourse. Uh, no, that, that basically said what was. No, that this is a country with huge resources and the, the majority are impoverished. The min it's, it's a minority that's actually taking advantage of this. We're going to change this economy so that it works for everybody. No, I think that could have been, uh, uh, you know, as, perhaps as effective as this polarizing discourse because Chavez, Chavez, of course, with this was able to mobilize huge. Uh, numbers of people. He won the he won his reelection in two thousand six with sixty three percent. He w he won the next reelection in two thousand twelve with fifty five percent. Those are impressive numbers. But I think, you know, of that percent, there was a a, a large anti Chavez element precisely because people felt so threatened by this. And so I think he could have lost some mobilization uh, here, but also would have lost some of the resistance uh, instead of. Um, Institution instead of sort of uh, making these structural changes, but in ways that didn't uh, respect transparency and, and accountability, there could have been this anti-corruption discourse that that said, "Okay, it's through it's through institutional growth, it's through transparency and accountability that we're actu actually going to be uh, uh, changing here." And there there were there were some indications of this. In fact. In the first year of Chavez, this didn't come from Chavez, but it came from people that were in public sector. There was a there was a saying: people would say something like, "Doing a favor for someone in your family or a family, a friend or something." People would say, "Ese es muy cuarta cuarta república." No, that's very fourth republic because Chavez said he was in the fifth republic, and so we would say, "Oh, that the, you know that favoritism, that's very fourth republic." So there 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 were resources, and I think that could have been different. Uh, Finally, in terms of communication, no, of course, hegemonic communication, that's, that's got to be attractive to anybody in power, no, uh, to have people that are continually supporting you. No, this is why any organization has its own sort of internal uh, communications and PR department. But having a different model in which you say, well, it's critical feedback, no, that's actually going to make us grow and absorb that, include that, even with all those difficulties, I think could have been uh, uh, could have been done. No, if these things had happened, I think we would be in a very different place. All of these things, I'm aware, I think would would have been more difficult. It might have meant that Chavez had been voted out in 2012, but it would have been better than where we are now. No, and I think that if these were if these were the the practices and and, and strategies they had taken, well, Chavismo could probably they might have been voted out and they would come back again and it could have been a more institutionalized movement that could have uh, promoted some longer term change. Thank you.